Okay, great. Uh, thanks for keeping up with me uh, till the very end. Um, I hope the, the last talk will live up to the expectations and keep you entertained and um, alive. So, um, so my goal here is, um, is to, uh, to fill in some gaps uh, that, um, that uh, the many talks that, uh, that uh, you had before might have left. Uh, so one sort of, of uh, goal of the first part of the talk uh, would be to, uh, to give you some uh, insight on, into, into how uh, unsupervised learning um, as addressed in, in the different uh, uh, you had so far uh, we're addressing. I don't need to mute myself, okay. Uh, um, so um, so I, I would like to, to give you some, um, um, some hands-on on, on how state-of-the-art uh, methodology uh, works when uh, one wants to address uh, this problem uh, of uh, 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 learning a complex uh, stimulus statistics and based on the, this uh, complex stimulus statistics um, to predict neural responses. Uh, so that's the, the first part. Uh, the second second part, I, I will try to frame uh, this um, this approach in a broader context in the sense that that uh, what is the case when when the uh, the computational principles uh, or the natural image statistics is not sufficient to um, uh, to go about uh, uh, predicting uh, neural behavior, and in the third part, uh, I will try to reflect on on um, on comments uh, during uh, my last talk and and after that, uh, which concerned um, whether um, uh, these neat theoretical ideas uh, can be can be tested in. In, in experiments uh, or not. Okay, so just a very quick uh, recap, which I hope uh, you'll be able to do. So, so the whole idea was was uh, to try to um, uh, to uh, to understand uh, how the, uh, the inner workings of the brain uh, are determined by uh, by natural image statistics. Um, and and uh, so we wanted to to discover the, the properties of, of these uh, internal models, um, and um, and we pitted against or quickly addressed uh, two forms of of uh, learning uh, uh, supervised techniques and unsupervised techniques, um, and uh, this is pretty much the the the, the backbone of, of or the skeleton of, of this whole stuff. Uh, one actually uh, lists uh, what's up differences uh, these different uh, approaches uh, might have. And uh, here I, I, I want to, to just highlight one thing that we, we left off uh, at, the, at the last lecture, that, uh, that, uh, that these uh, unsupervised degenerative models uh, can be hierarchical and, and uh, might contain uh, top-down uh, interactions as well. But uh, rather being really um, a, a delivered uh, result, but uh, it it uh, only remained as a as a part of our, our wish list or, or or something like that. Um, and uh, so we want to uh, to to briefly uh, address this uh, with uh, with state of the art uh, learning. Um, <clears throat> just a very quick re recap that uh, the, the thing that that limited us uh, from all this uh, was that we were uh, dealing with uh, with linear models. So there, uh, uh, the the initial uh, goal being phrased as as uh, trying to to learn the, uh, the empirical distribution of of, of the environment uh, with some some parametric uh, approximation of the, the distribution, and this was done in a way that we wanted to discover uh, the latent variable that um, sort of determine the, the structure that we observed uh, in. In pixel intensities, um, and uh, the way uh, it was phrased that was that we needed to learn a likelihood function and a prior in order to uh, to actually arrive to uh, to this objective function. And the linear case was was a really uh, simple one where uh, where uh, we just 
uh, at a normal uh, likelihood. And okay, so so why do why why can't we, we go beyond um, beyond the, the linear case? Uh, it is because uh, because uh, if you have a, a very complex likelihood function and uh, we have uh, for instance a, a very simple prior like a normal which we are experts in in dealing with, we can integrate sample whatever we want. Uh, the, this integral. Uh, will be will be really 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 tough. So it's, it it is uh, not really uh, manageable. And uh, and although we do not need the explicit integral, or at least we sort of can omit uh, uh, this this uh, entity called the, the marginal likelihood when we do the inference. So uh, it appears in the in the in the denominator of uh, Bayes rule, uh, but uh, sometimes we argue that that this, this thing is not depending on on y, so the inferred quantity, and this way we can this this can only be uh, cons considered as a as a normalizing uh, factor uh, to a uh, function, so that uh, the whole thing the this this uh, two factor uh, thing uh, will have a, an integral of one. So. Uh, the delimiter only ensures uh, the uh, uh, the normalization. So this way we might uh, just end up with this. But still, if we if we do not the norm, do not know the normalizing constant, uh, then uh, then uh, some additional downstream computations that we want to do with uh, uh, with uh, the posterior will be will be tough uh, to do. Uh, for instance, when we want to uh, make decisions. Uh, then an, a non-normalized version of the posterior will have, uh, will have uh, some limited uh, potential. So that's why uh, we want to um, to so somehow come up with, with a formalism that uh, that can um, achieve what we want to learn this um, um, uh, an approximation uh, to a very complex. Um, uh, empirical distribution, for instance, the distribution of images, right? Um, so uh, I start off with this. Uh, so, um, uh, so sorry. Um, so, so one one note uh, that uh, because of some historical reasons, so far I said that the goal. So, so the, the thing that we wanted to learn the the, uh, the sort of uh, mathematical construct was uh, was uh, named as. Uh, uh, Q that was parameterized by theta, which depended on, on X. Uh, from now on, uh, I will switch to a slightly to a different notation. Instead of uh, uh, Q theta, uh, we will call this uh, P theta. Um, I'm sorry for that. Uh, this is um, this helps you to learn to be flexible, uh, and it helps you to to understand uh, the usual notation that you have in in the literature. So once you 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 accommodate this uh, this sharp uh, shift, uh, then uh, you you will have zero access to uh, to the to the literature. Um, and also, it's a it's a funny thing that uh, so far I, I try to to use uh, this um, uh, this this uh, simpler semantics that uh, y comes after x. So the y's are the latent variables. Um, again, tradition uh, brings us uh, to a point where we need to switch uh, from Y to Z. So the latent variables from now on will be Z. Um, yeah. So, so, so now this is the the, the sort of the parametric approximation to uh, to, uh, to to the to the, uh, the likelihood function to the likelihood function, uh, the, which is the exact which is the same as the the. the the empirical distribution, and um, and uh, so here we we will do an exercise uh, where I will first just make sort of senseless uh, uh, little transformations of the original expression, and at the at the end somewhere where we get here at the at the slide, uh, then uh, this whole this this whole apparently senseless things uh, will make sense. So what we'll do, we will do here is uh, we will introduce um, uh, the variational autoencoders, which I'm sort of sure that that most of you are are not uh, aware of or are familiar with. How many of you 
are familiar with, with the variation of electron encoder. One, two, three, four, five, ish. So it still makes sense to uh, to do that. Um, I think the, the 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 whole exercise is is pretty fun. Uh, so uh, so first of all, uh, we start off with uh, with this, and uh, uh, what I'm saying here is that uh, this equals to uh, to this quantity. Uh, um, why is that? Uh, so first of all, this q of q that that is parameterized by phi pi uh, is just a or let's consider it as an arbitrary probability density. Okay, there is no right now we have no constraints on it, just an arbitrary thing. Uh, and uh, here in this in this box, I I explain why these uh, things are equal to the when you you uh, want to uh, to calculate the expectation uh, over uh, of uh, some function over a, a, a probability distribution uh, q. Uh, this this means that uh, we have an integral. Uh, if we have um, an expectation uh, that is uh, that is uh, calculated over uh, a function that does not depend on the on the on the variable that uh, the distribution is uh, defined over, uh, then what you end up with is that that um, that uh, because uh, the integral uh, goes over x. And uh, and this guy does not depend on x. This way, uh, you can you can take this uh, this function outside of the integral, and you end up with uh, with the same quantity. So the expectation with respect to a, uh, a distribution that does not depend on uh, on the argument of of this function will be exactly the the function itself. So this way, since this distribution uh, is a z dependent thing, it's over z. Uh, this way, uh, the equality holds. Okay, so we pretty much just doing nothing here. Um, okay, so the um, and yeah, it just uh, reiterated that uh, this is an arbitrary uh, probability density function. So we can go uh, uh, to the to the next step. Uh, so what we uh, we will do here is that uh, we will just uh, just apply the the definition of the of the conditional uh, uh, probability. So the conditional probability uh, p of z given x uh, is nothing is equals to the joint of x and z over uh, 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 the, uh, the the probability of of x. So here what we are doing is nothing else but but using the the basic definition of, of uh, conditional probability. Okay. So still super basic, um, and um, the next step would, would be this. Um, we extend uh, this original expression by multiplying it by one. Uh, multiplying, multiplying it by one will be obviously done in a quirky way. Uh, so uh, uh, this uh, Q uh, will be multiplied, will be multiplying the expression and we'll also divide the expression. So this expansion is, is again, just a trivial step. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so next, uh, we, we can uh, break this logarithm into two. Again, this is a uh, simple algebra. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the logarithm of a, of a multiple quantity will be the sum of the, of the individual quantities. And uh, the other thing that we do is that for this joint distribution, we again apply uh, the definition of the, of the conditional distribution. Okay, so again, the interpretation of the whole thing is not our job right now. All right now, I just ask you to to understand the very basic algebra that we are doing, and hopefully, it, it, uh, we are at the at the fourth step, and and uh, it will be clear. So what we lost. We lost. Um, my computer lost uh, uh, the internet. We are still on ASUS, which is good. Um, so it says uh, connecting to Zoom. Hmm. Okay, back. Again, uh, 
Okay, sorry for the hiccup. Okay, almost there. That's great that we are seeing something else and so somehow everything is super slow. I need it very okay. Right, because uh, the sync is not that great between the two. So right now I'm changing here, I'm not changing there. Do you think it's the Wi-Fi or the computer? It's um, it's it seems to be uh, the Wi-Fi. Yeah, so maybe if people here could sorry, maybe, maybe everyone could stop using Wi-Fi if they do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys, I don't want to intimidate you. Um, so just low profile conversations, please. <laughs> so it's uh, it's jumping back and forth. Uh, right now it says that, that it is just trying to connect. Shall I try the this 5G? Or you send the presentation? I do it everybody here on that computer. As I, I'm doing the switch, and uh, maybe this perturbation will just be lucrative enough. Let's see. Now that is fast. Okay. Okay, uh, lovely. Uh, so, so up to this point, uh, it was super basic algebra. And now, uh, uh, sorry for, for, for badging, that was a hip, hiccup in, in the local internet. Uh, so I'm hopefully back on track. I'm on a different network now. Um, so, so the next step is again just just uh, using uh, the definition of of some uh, some basic um, um, quantities in, in probability theory. Uh, so the Kuhlberg library divergence, uh, which uh, we introduced uh, um, the first very first day. Uh, so it was the second day of the uh, of the of the school, um, which measures the distance uh, between. Sort of a distance between between two uh, probability distributions Q and so this is not X this is, is P so Q and P is measured and um, if you check how this looks like uh, you will easily find that um, that uh, the quantities that we that we have here uh, exactly map uh, to uh, to to two forms of of uh, Kullback library library divergence uh, one between uh, two quantities and one between these two quantities and this is a time when when we only only used algebra and definitions so we can stop now and think a bit okay so so right now we have three terms uh we ended up with, with a cute little term uh the 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 marginal log marginal uh, uh likelihood and then ended up with with this um and uh, apparently, I'm happy with that. Uh, maybe no one else, because from this little expression, we got that one. But the interpretation is pretty cool of this one. So uh, there are three terms. Uh, let's start with the, with the last one. So, so this one is actually the, uh, the posterior distribution. So when we observe x, uh, then what is the probability of z in our original uh, Model that, that or generative model that that meant to approximate uh, the the empirical distribution. So this is what 
I, I, I call it a, a difficult beast because it's hard to calculate. Uh, and here we have uh, uh, this, uh, this quantity that we, we introduced here, which we did not, did not provide any, any meaning uh, to. Uh, but funny enough, we phrased it as if it was, again, some sort of a, a posterior distribution. So, so this is the time when, when we, we, we provide an interpretation to, to that. So imagine that this is an approximate version of the posterior distribution. So uh, this is something that, uh, that Manish was also speaking about. You have uh, some exotic uh, uh, probability distribution uh, with many modes and, and uh, quirky uh, statistics. Uh, and instead, uh, you have something that you can deal with. For instance, just uh, um, the best approximating uh, normal distribution, okay? So this would be uh, the best, let's think of it as, as the best uh, approximating uh, normal distribution uh, that approximates uh, the posterior. So what if it is the best? It means that the, the, the best means that we are as close as possible uh, with QP, meaning that this PL divergence, since it has a minimum zero when the two distribution matches, so this will this 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 quantity will will shrink. So when you have a better uh, approximating Q, then it will get closer to P. Okay. So if this is our interpretation that that uh, that uh, Q is is a is the approximate posterior, then this is a cool thing because although we cannot uh, calculate this one, but if we can somehow manage to uh, to uh, to shrink uh, this thing, uh, then we can also know that uh, that the approximate posterior will be as close as possible to uh, to the real posterior. Uh, and and so so what the goal might be then? We have these these blue quantities. So this is a, a difference between one term and the other term. If you maximize these these two things. Uh, then that means that this will shrink because we are we are trying to to approximate the the log posterior uh, uh, sorry the the log marginal likelihood. So uh, this has a, a fixed value based on a, a set of stimuli, right? So if you have tons of observations, then uh, this uh, log marginal uh, uh, likelihood will have a, six, a fixed value. If we if we maximize this one, then this will be minimized. That means that that uh, what we achieve is that that uh, if we change the parameters of phi such that this becomes minimal, and this also means that uh, uh, this approximate posterior will be as close as possible to, to the to the real posterior. Um, so so then uh, we also only need to uh, to uh, to somehow. Um, uh, tweak these these uh, parameters phi, and um, and we don't need to explicitly calculate the, the posterior. Instead, we just need to handle the, the, the approximate posterior. Okay, so now uh, this is sort of a, a motivation, a beautiful motivation, and uh, we can go uh, to uh, to interpret uh, the rest. Uh, so this uh, this is so beautiful that uh, that we gave a, give a, a name to. This is uh, for the the expectation uh, lower bound uh, because it's a lower bound uh, to the log uh, log marginal likelihood. So if we calculate this one, that we know that the log marginal likelihood can be all, only be higher than that because a positive number is uh, is added to it. That's why it is called a, a lower bound. Uh, so this one is parameterized by by theta, which are the parameters of the of the, the generative model, and of this um, the parameters of of the of the Q, which we call the recognition model. The recognition model because it recognizes what's underlying uh, the the images. So Q will be called the, the recognition model, and uh, and and P will still be the our, our, our generative model that that is our, our primary uh, sort of goal to uh, to learn to. Okay, and and one more thing uh, about 
about the, the interpretation of these two terms, uh, this is, uh, I think it's, it's pretty uh, instructive again. So, so what it does here is that, that based on our recognition model, we make inferences about the, the features that might, might underlie our observations. This is, the, the, this is given by the approximate posterior. So we have a, an approximate posterior. And under this approximate posterior, uh, we calculate uh, the probability of our observations. So we go up, uh, estimating uh, the, the underlying sort of causes or, or latent variables. And then based on, on, on our on inferences, we want to, to estimate uh, how likely the, uh, the observations were. This is called the reconstruction term. So how well we can reconstruct the image from, the, uh, from, from our inferences. Uh, and the other one uh, is uh, uh, something that we call a regularization term, uh, whereby uh, we want to, uh, to calculate how different uh, our inferences are from, from our, our prior expectation. So prior expectation um, semantically means that what we expect from, uh, from our outside world. And so, so this uh, second term in the, in the elbow uh, calculates how much or actual inferences deviate uh, from what we expect. So uh, this one, We'll have a simple form. Uh, it can be, let's first let's consider it as a, as a Gaussian. So the prior will be a simple Gaussian. Uh, uh, this will be an arbitrary complex thing. Uh, this can be also an arbitrary complex thing because we did not make any assumptions about the parametric form, uh, whether it's linear or not. In fact, it can be highly, highly nonlinear. And, uh, and all these quantities uh, can be uh, easily uh, can can be uh, uh, so if let's let's make it it more down to earth. Uh, so imagine that the mapping here we have a, a mapping uh, in in this uh, generative model from z to x. Uh, so this mapping can be arbitrarily complex. And normally these way th these days what we what we how the we parameterize these mappings is uh, by using neural networks because those can. Uh, that, that's a very flexible model class to, to parameterize arbitrary complex mappings. So you have a, a, a very complex uh, high dimension neural network, which parameterizes uh, this guy, and another neural network uh, that parameterizes uh, this guy. And so we only need to, uh, to, uh, to, to tune their parameters uh, uh, such that, uh, that uh, this is uh, this will be uh, maximized, and all these quantities will be easy, easy to calculate uh, once you just define a, a, a neural network. Um, so, so this is sort of a, a recipe, and uh, it's a very successful recipe. The variation of the encoder. Uh, well, it's a large chunk of of uh, understanding uh, the the variation of the encoder. You need. To, uh, a bit more for that, but but still, this is the the, the, the backbone. So I, I just wanted to to give you a feel that that um, it's not only the case that that we can only assess uh, linear models. Uh, there are ways to uh, uh, to to approach the the, the nonlinear ones, at, and it's not that uh, difficult. The whole thing. Uh, do you have any questions? Okay, I, I hope I did not lose you or there I, I could deliver the, the, the message. Um, and, and yeah, so, so the, it's the important thing that uh, the, this lower bound, the expectation lower bound is just as good as, as our variational posterior uh, is good to, to approximate the, uh, the real posterior. Um, so, so this is this is our uh, this is our simple case. Uh, this is the elbow plus term. So we, if we maximize this one, this will be minimized, um, and uh, in this way we have a sort of a, um, a guarantee that uh, we are heading uh, in the right direction. Um, still, it does not <clears throat> solve our quest for for high hierarchical representation. Um, I would not say that I leave it as a sort of a homework, uh, but um, I hope that I, I gave you a gist that. That it is not rocket science, um, and um, and one can actually come up with uh, with with a with a higher version. Uh, yeah, it, here I, I I just make uh, this 
sort of a recap that uh, theta are the parameters of the generality model, pi are the parameters of the, of the uh, recognition model, and uh, sort of a notation that uh, some, sometimes we use is that, uh, that, uh, the, uh, that we have an f of z that characterizes the, the mapping from uh, z to x, and this is the generality model, g of x that, uh, that uh, parameterizes the mapping from x to z, which is the recognition model. And uh, so, uh, so, um, uh, so the 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 generality model is trying to to model the, the sort of the mechanics uh, of the environment with a single off and off and not a double off, um, and uh, uh, the G of Z uh, is trying to 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 deliver us uh, the approximate inference. Okay. And both of these are, are simple uh, neural networks, either uh, uh, MLPs or, or convolutional networks. Yes. So I do not understand why do why is it uh, called lower bound? In what sense the blue part is the lower bound? Okay. So so imagine that um, that you have the right parameters of the general model, the theta parameters. To calculate uh, the uh, the marginal likelihood uh, uh, p of x, right, which is the best which is uh, a parameterization of the empirical uh, distribution. Okay, and um, and what I'm saying, what what I was trying to say is that evaluating this whole distribution, uh, so giving a, a parameterization uh, that evaluates this whole distribution is really tough. Uh, to discover the, the latent variables, latent variables, and and to uh, to find uh, the parameters uh, of the of the of the likelihood is is very very difficult. Instead, what we do is that that uh, we don't want to uh, to find um, the whole marginal. We don't. We cannot calculate the whole marginal likelihood. What we can calculate is part of it. We we lose. Uh, the the KL between the KL divergence between the uh, approximate posterior and the real posterior, which is a positive number, and so this one, the elbow, will certainly be lower for the right parameter. If you if you if you knew the right parameters, theta parameters, uh, for the for the marginal likelihood, it will certainly be lower uh, the elbow than the 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 marginal likelihood itself, right? So this way. What we know when we calculate the elbow, what we know is that the, the, the marginal likelihood is certainly higher, so it can be only a lower bound. It's not the real value, it's a lower bound. But if, you, if we increase this lower bound by, by training, by, by tuning the parameters, uh, then it will get uh, closer. Yes? Uh, I guess I have two questions. The first is uh, for the generative model. Uh, I guess using the general model, you, you just calculate P of Z given X using Bayes rule. P of X, P of like the, I guess if you want to calculate like P of Z given X for like the KL term, yeah, uh, then you would use Bayes rule. You think after calculating P of X given Z using the general. Uh, if you wanted to to really calculate uh, the the P of Z given X, uh, then you could use the Bayes rule. The, the problem is, is that it is it is not really a tractable calculation. Oh, okay. So uh, the, the 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 plus side of of the of the of, of this this approach is that that this beast, uh, the, the the posterior, the real posterior, never has to be calculated in order to uh, to uh, to to optimize your your. So it's, if it is the objective function the, to maximize the elbow. You never need to calculate the posterior itself, only the, the approximate posterior, which is called the, the variational approximation to the to the posterior. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. And then the other question was, um, I guess, what exactly do these two neural networks look like in order to sort of keep sort of running hacks of um, what the two probability approximates are? So, so the the, the neural network. Um, so you, how it looks like, like how how do you, how do you sort of prioritize your your neural network? 
but if there is a recipe to do that. But like how, I guess, what does the architecture look like? So it's, uh, it uh, normally depends on, on you and your, your intuitions. Um, uh, it turns out that this, this is a pretty delicate question. Uh, and I, I just want to give you a hint for, uh, for where the delicacies are. Uh, so uh, so in, in these primitive models, there, there is this, um, this understanding that, uh, that uh, the fun with neural networks is that it's hard to, to over-parameterize uh, your, your, your mapping from X to Z, for instance. Uh, so it's not a problem if, if the, the neural network itself is, is larger than, than, than necessary, uh, because uh, it, it's you know, some, let's, let's just put it in a nutshell, that some, some, so because of some sort of magic, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this overfitting will not affect us. In case of, of uh, variation on encoders, it is not completely true. You can uh, safely overparameterize the, the recognition model, but the, the generative model uh, can be more sensitive uh, to over parameterization. So, uh, so uh, it can be the case that that if you over parameterize, so you have a four layer fully connected uh, neural network and uh, not sufficiently large data set, uh, then uh, you will you will get some some nasty overfitting. Uh, so there uh, you might need some some sort of uh, informed guess or. Or, or exploration on on how much you can uh, you can uh, decrease the complexity of the genetic model. Um, I'm sure that this not, does not completely answer uh, the, the, the depth of your question, uh, but uh, normally um, uh, you can you can use the, the whole uh, whole weapon set that, that you have uh, for for these genetic models as well. You can use CNNs. Or, or 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 other forms. So, thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, um, oh, sorry. So, what I wanted to what one point that I wanted to make is referring to. Uh, to uh, Manish's uh, talk, uh, the the Helmholtz machine, I think it's a it's a it's a it's a funny insight that uh, it was back in in uh, 1996 when uh, when Helmholtz machine was introduced, um, and that uh, as Manish also uh, uh, highlighted uh, was based on on a separate generative and recognition model. The Helmholtz machine was was uh, formulated to have a non a, a learnable nonlinear generative model. Uh, originally, it was it was uh, it, it was uh, using discrete variables, but there was a, a nonlinear uh, generative model uh, in that, and um, and it took uh, sort of twenty-ish years to re rediscover uh, the, the 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 sort of the necessity or or the convenience of having two separate models to learn when you are one, you you learn a, a, a you want to learn unsupervised learning you want to learn a generative models. So it's sort of a convergent evolution here. Uh, apparently, uh, this having this this uh, this recognition model uh, separately from from a generative model um, is a is a is a huge relief when when you uh, you want to uh, to to train such models. Um, and it's it's it might be a question whether whether this this was a good enough incentive uh, for the for the nervous system to uh, to turn to this. Uh, um, turn to this uh, to this approach or not? Uh, no matter whether you think that there is a separate recognition and generative model in in, in the nervous system, uh, if we are able to learn a generative model that is nonlinear, um, we can use it uh, to uh, to predict uh, uh, neural uh, neural activity, and um, and to do that, I will I will just make one step uh, where I won't do the math for that. Uh, I hope that uh, you got the motivation and intuitions uh, that it is it is feasible to do that. Uh, so if we instead of a one layer uh, neural network, we have a, a two layer one uh, where we have Z one. Uh, Z one would be the, the lower. So here is X. This is Z one and Z two. And we do the, the the math. It turns out that 
uh, that it is again we, we we can come up with with an elbow, and it defines uh, a specific architecture uh, uh, for uh, for for the computations, and uh, and I don't want to uh, to go through all the all the components of the of the of the of the, of the calculations. What I want to emphasize here is that there is one point here uh, where there, from Z to the higher level layer. Uh, there is uh, feedback coming to, uh, to to Z1, and um, and I regard this as a sort of a normative argument uh, for uh, for having uh, top down connections uh, in in in, a, in an unsupervised learning uh, setting, um, and um, and once uh, there is a normative argument, then one can actually test what sort of consequences uh, it might have. Um, yeah, so so I will try to br briefly uh, sketch the uh, the consequences. Um, so if we if we if we build a model uh, that that is trained on on natural images, uh, then um, then we can test what what it learns, and um, at, the, at the level of of Z one, uh, we find sort of similar representation that we we had with a uh, earlier in, in the also in field model, yes. I'm just I'm intrigued here. So you're saying you can do a two stage probabilistic model, and that gives you kind of this network interpretation. Yeah. But this would be different. Like like you could still in the one stage model parameterize the functions by multi level, multi layer networks, right? So, in what sense would that those be multi? Go back to the slide. Uh, I'm just trying to understand the motivation. So, like the top one layer of VA is the P, you're P in your Q functions, right? And yep. they're, you, I think you said earlier that those could be multi layer networks, right? Parameterizing those functions. Yeah. So, so here, uh, this is, this is a, a multi layer MLP. Uh, these these all are multi-layer MLP, and the, what you are referring to is that that in fact uh, you have uh, some hierarchy uh, defined uh, in in the mapping between between uh, a latent layer and the observed layer, even if we have just a one layer, uh, hid, one hidden layer. Yeah, right? so I guess I'm wondering, like, so if you have this two-layer VAE, and your MLP has one hidden layer each. And then you compare that with a one layer VAE with multiple layers in the mapping. Yeah. Kind of learnable mapping, like how different and similar are those things? I guess that's sort of what I'm curious about. Um, yeah, so um, so the sort of representation that, that we, we learn. Um, when when we have a one one hidden layer but highly complex generative model, then uh, uh, they should somehow match to uh, to the to the multi layer one. Um, but uh, so there is a there is a strong incentive. So so it's sort of a a, a biological. It has a, both a, a machine learning and a, and a biological. Uh, motivation to uh, to have uh, multiple layers. So uh, so when we have multiple layers, then we have a higher set of probabilistic features uh, that we can use uh, to uh, to make flexible inferences on. So if we if we learn um, a representation, for instance, uh, in in uh, in a, the next case, and we have this one, and uh, we find that at higher level layers. There is a representation for 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 complex features like faces or objects. Uh, then, when we are tasked with, uh, 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 with Manish's collaborators, uh, like uh, try to distinguish uh, between orientation of this or that, uh, then you don't have a proper representation to do that. So it makes sense to uh, to to have a hierarchical uh, set of probabilistic features. But I, I acknowledge that that um, that one can one can actually do this with a single layer. It is just hard to to say what should be the the topmost layer. Should those be objects? Should should those be scenes? Like like host, so so 
our generative model goes beyond, much beyond objects. When we, we try to interpret our, 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 our environment, uh, then, then, uh, then our inferences go uh, like I'm at, at a summer school and it, it makes predictions towards what we, I, will, I will be doing uh, in, in, in two minutes and the, what you will be doing in, in, in two minutes and so on. So what should be the, the topmost layer? It's a, it's a question. And if you have a higher color representation, it, uh, it, uh, it really us from, from considering this and, and it's, it's a much more flexible uh, tool to, to make uh, uh, computations. I have maybe an even more elementary, I mean, a more elementary question, which is, uh, in my mind, the, the, the VAE is created because we can we hypothesize that there are some latent components that are much more, more lower dimensional compared to the things we observe. And that gives that specific structure. Now, what is the motivation for having two different layers of compressed and why couldn't I have like you know many parallel VAEs in the first layer and one in the second or vice versa? I mean what what is the motivation for this specific structure? So, so because for the VAE there is this central kind of guess that we can describe things well by assuming that some variety of things that we observe come from a coarser cause, which can be described in a coarser way. But what is the equivalent guess for this structure? So um, let's, I'm trying to be as dark as possible. Um, so, so the way, uh, I consider these these different layers of the of the of the of the of the VAE uh, are is is that that uh, the different uh, layers represent different complexity uh, statistics. Early in the in the hierarchy, some lower level statistics, uh, even just linear statistics, higher level layers, more complex ones, and and even more more and more complex ones. Uh, so these these features are are, are organized uh, uh, in this hierarchical way uh, based on the sort of the complexity of the statistics that they represent, and uh, and one motivation for that is that that um, um, so it's sort of a, a hypothesis uh, about our environment that features. Uh, in the in, in our environment are, are organized uh, in in such a manner. Okay, so maybe I misunderstood your your drawing. So what you're saying is now before I had C one, now you're saying are you saying I'm going to take the one that I had before and I will endow it yes and say that Z one is coming from a Z two which is coarser than Z one. Yeah, okay. correct. Okay, then it's yeah, yeah. So like if we have objects that define. Uh, um, yeah, it just this, this so 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 this so is we are object defined surfaces that surfaces define uh, then textures that textures define uh, 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 correlations of of, uh, of, uh, of edges and edges then define our, our pixel intensities. Yes, the idea is very nice, but I do hear Don't you boost the identification? Certainly. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's a, it's a. This is this is a, this is a, one thing that that uh, that uh, Manish also mentioned, uh, 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 and uh, he referred uh, to Apo uh in that sense. Uh, where, if you have a nonlinear uh, uh, generative model, then the identifiability of the of the latent is sort of inevitable. Unless you make those those uh, extra sort of assumptions that uh, you drive uh, some sort of an action, uh, that so this is not the only way that that uh, that uh, what what uh, uh, Apo uh, assumed. This is certainly one way, um, and uh, and it's so I don't want to 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 lose it here that okay so it's unidentifiable. It's, it's certainly true 
that we are not solely learning in an unsupervised manner. Uh, I just want to, to push this card as far as possible so that we, we see what sort of, of uh, how far we can go with this, this, this assumption. Because if we start to, uh, to, 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 to mingle with, uh, with other assumptions like, like active learning or, 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 or goal direct behavior, uh, then, the, then you will have much, much more assumptions and uh, it's a it's a viable route to to try to to discover what we can achieve with this. So uh, the identifiability question here is resolved by inductive biases. Inductive biases mean that some sort of a, an assumption on how the uh, the, the generative uh, model should look like. For instance, if if we use a, a convolutional neural network, then uh, the the assumption behind the convolutional neural network is it's pretty much that uh, the environment or environment is, is trans translational invariant. The statistics that I see in that direction will be the same as in that direction. Um, so that is that is implemented in one inductive bias as as uh, as a CCN. Here, uh, in order to to have this uh, two layer model, there is one inductive bias that uh, here the mapping is is linear. Uh, it's a it's a huge question in, in in huge and open question in, in machine learning how you phrase those uh, those inductive biases. Uh, you might uh, just to give you other hints uh, for inductive biases. Uh, you might uh, if you want to do object recognition, you might uh, want to uh, to implement uh, inductive biases such as Gestalt principles, which which are which are century old uh, principles that people seem to use uh, for. Uh, for uh, uh, for for discovering objects in in in, in our environment, these look like as if they were rule of thumbs for for the per, uh, perceptual system to uh, uh, to uh, to discover objects, and and there are actually uh, uh, computer vision models uh, which uh, uh, exploit these these special principles to to achieve more efficient learning. Yes. I think that it's connected. Uh, I mean, can we be sure that the the, uh, the VAE is actually the true generative model of the day? Um, so under um no, so so there there because of the unidentifiability uh uh you we, we cannot be sure uh because for instance uh if you just have a a, a normal uh prior then you don't you don't you you so uh, norm, the the simplest way to to see it is that the normal prior itself is is rotational invariant and uh and our features in the environment are not not arbitrarily uh sort of 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 or, Rotations of, of of the of the features; those are real features or something like that. So, so there are there are certainly uh, some um, some ambiguities in 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 the generative model. Um, just to highlight one more thing: uh, so, um, if so we, for testing, we we used uh, texture images. So, so these are synthetic textures. Like this is a, 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 a snake skin. Uh, this is the correct soil that we are getting more familiar with these days. Uh, these are uh, some some grains, um, and what we find is that at the level of, of Z two, um, these dots, individual dots, correspond to the knees of the of the posterior at the level of Z two. Uh, and what we what you see here is that that the different uh, texture from these are are somehow separated. Uh, which is a pretty cool thing because because what we know from uh, from electrophysiology is that that at the level of B two uh, when you have multiple instances of the same texture family uh, the the response of a of a B two uh, neuron will be invariant to the different instances uh, from the same family they vary across the different families so if you have the, the grains uh, then you will have a slightly different response if you have this uh, this 
don't know what what sort of uh, texture it is, and you have a very different one, but it will be consistent across across the different instances. And this is not true for uh, for V one, right? Uh, and and as you might um, have um, uh, an insight from the previous slide, uh, this is similar to uh, to, to 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 the to this VAE. Uh, the variation uh, within a texture family will be low for for a for for a Z two representation, but it will be high for for a Z one representation. And and the consequence of this um, and um, and this might be sort of a, a useful argument for for these hierarchical representations uh, that that this this sort of of uh, increased invariance uh, to uh, to different instances of of texture uh, families um, is actually a form of compression because we get insensitive to to changes in in the in the actual uh, stimulus identity. We only are sensitive to, to to a broader class, right? So this way, it is it is sort of a, a way to to uh, to achieve uh, gradual compression. So we achieve some sort of invariances, or we learn some sort of invariances uh, in this in this generative model, and um, these invariances go for like objects would go as high as uh, would provide us different uh, identical responses um, uh, for different lightings or, or postures or something like that. Uh, but here the invariance uh, at the level V2 only concerns different instances from the same family, uh, which, is, uh, which is rather cool because, uh, because uh, uh, so this, this sort of, of, of pattern is something that, that uh, can be observed in, uh, in uh, in, in newer recordings as well, then we want to either decode um, the family of the of the of the stimulus, the texture family that the stimulus came from, or the or the the stimulus identity uh, from V1. Uh, we can better decode the stimulus identity that we call sample classification, and we can uh, decode better the family uh, from a V2, and this is similar here as well. Um, yeah, I, I will just try to to very quickly uh, go through this. Um, so uh, some deeper insights can be obtained by the fact that what sort of statistics is represented at at the level of in order to in order to be able to identify uh, or learn about textures, what sort of statistics uh, we need to uh, to represent. Uh, so this is a, a, a paper back. Uh, from 2001, I guess, uh, from Aero Simoncelli's uh, lab. It's a, a computer vision paper uh, where they investigated what sort of, of statistics between edges we need to learn in order to, to be able to sort of synthesize uh, textures uh, with a, within a given family. And what they found was that, that uh, you need to learn um, Correlations between uh, between filters that have different uh, spatial frequency, correlations uh, between uh, different orientations, and uh, you need to learn uh, correlations across uh, different positions. And um, and an additional thing that they found was that that uh, these filters uh, uh, that you need to to track the correlation of can be either uh, filters that are sensitive to uh, to the actual phase. Of the of the of this of this wave, so, uh, so the changes in in uh, in dark and and uh, uh, and light uh, stripes, or uh, energy filters which are insensitive to, to changes in the phase. So you you change uh, the 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 phase of the grating, and the the neuron uh, would give or the, the artificial neuron uh, would give the the same. Uh, response. So this would be an energy filter, and uh, this would be a linear filter, which is sensitive to phase, and uh, the correlations across uh, both linear filters and energy filters uh, need to be learned. Um, and and these guys are, are sensitive to phase shifts, uh, while these guys are, are not sensitive to uh, the phase shifts. So uh, so that means that that at the level of of uh, of V two. Uh, and if our model for, for V2 is good enough, 
at the level of Z2 uh, should be such that that uh, our neurons should be sensitive or insensitive to, to we should find uh, neurons that are sensitive to uh, to uh, to phases or insensitive ones. So one can one can then test this. Uh, you can have um, natural images or alter, altered versions of the natural images where you you remove the the, the phase structure and this is called uh, a scrambled image. So you you have this, you have similar uh, similar components that are active that are contributing to this image. You just lose uh, the uh, the phase information uh, when you when you reconstruct uh, this image and. Um, and just to cut the story short, uh, short the story short. Uh, so you see these these neurons that across different families they show some sort of sensitive to uh, to phase in, in model and uh, in the in the experiment as well. And you have a, a distribution over over these uh, these uh, different neurons. So it's uh, it's it only gives us insight that some very specific things are learned in uh, about the the statistics. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think I, I will not go into into the the very details. So shall we have a break? No, we should not. Okay. Uh, so I will I will just really skim through uh, this stuff uh, that uh, uh, some uh, additional properties of, of neural responses can be predicted, like like uh, uh, the correlation between uh, between responses. I I won't explain those in detail. Uh, and uh, it can account for, for effects like, like illusions uh, through the, through the top-down uh, computations, uh, thereby uh, when you have uh, like a condition square like this and you have a, a neuron uh, which is uh, which sensitive to, to an edge oriented in, in this way uh, as the illusory uh, edge would be. Uh, you find in um, in experiments uh, that uh, neurons in V1 uh, are sent, are responding to to the to the illusory con contour. So what uh, the, the it, it is done is that um, that uh, you have the the real square uh, moved uh, back and forth, uh, and this shift is represented here. And there is a sort of an optimal shift of the of the square where the neuron responds. And uh, and when there you can do the same shift uh, when there is just this illusory uh, square, and apparently the, the, the neuron uh, provides a response as well. Uh, we have sort of better better illustrations than than this uh, by now. It's just an older version, but uh, here again uh, we we have uh, similar effects. Um, so can you explain how it works? Because in the original work, they they assume it was some kind of feedback. So, so the key here was that they showed, they showed response in V1, and they assumed that it was feedback from V2. Correct. So like in your case, it couldn't be that. That's, uh, yeah, yes, it is It is a feedback. Uh, so so that's, uh, that's feedback you added? Or? So the feedback uh, is not, not this one, not manipulating this one, rather. Um, Once it starts, um, so so because uh, in the in in the elbow uh, we have this term, so uh, Q of Z given x one and uh, x and Z two, uh, this is sort of a feedback term uh, that affects uh, Z one, and uh, the, the exact same uh, thing causes that. That although at the level of of, uh, of Z1 uh, textures are not decodable, so the texture representation is there. Uh, you cannot linearly decode uh, texture from there. Uh, but because the feedback is specific to textures, this way you can decode um, texture from the correlations of Z1. Uh, neuron of oh, V1 neurons, and uh, sort of a proxy to that uh, was was shown in, in, in monkey recording. Uh, 
So it 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 this this top down feedback has predictions uh, with respect to to the correlation structure. You're talking about the stuff of our new code. No, um, I'm stop, I'm speaking about the stuff that we did with uh, uh, with Volsinger. It, uh, it's a uh, and um, PNS paper. And can you say, I mean, really, what's the normative reason for considering these conditions? Because I could imagine constructing this hierarchy where C1 would be conditionally, Z1 conditioned on X would be independent from C2. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so what was the, the general reason? That's, that's, a, that's um, a, a, a beautiful and very deep question. So, uh, so when when you are when you are you are trying to construct your recognition model, what you are uh, actually doing is that uh, the first step was that that uh, we had this nonsense expectation uh, um, added to to the log marginal likelihood. So, let's hope that uh, I'm writing big enough that there's and. This is where I feel to work. Yeah. Yeah. So we have the log the given of X and uh, and then we start off with uh, by now we know that this is the uh, the variational uh, for player. Okay, so then, so this is what what we need to uh, to somehow figure out how it works, and uh, and the way uh, we partition this this joint uh, posterior uh, was. The one that you see here is that uh, Q of Z1 given X Z2 times uh, Q Z2 given X. And an alternative would be that, uh, yeah, I will, I will write it down. So it's basically how you do your correlation of approximation. Correct. So you could do this chain like version. Which is just this times Z2 given Z1. But it gives rise to two different bounds. Uh, so the term that you throw out to get your equality will be different. So in, in both cases, uh, in both cases, uh, it is uh, the, the, the bound uh, uh, is is getting rid of the of the of the KL between the, the joint variation post. Uh, how you achieve it might differ and the intuition behind why it is why this one is is a, a more sort of lucrative uh, approximation is this the reason the reason why in a, from a normative point of view the reason why one one wants to to have a higher representation something you have a z1 why on earth would you want to to have a z2 and uh, normatively the easiest way to phrase Phrase it is that you want to have an expressive higher over Z1. Nor initially in, in, a, in, a, in a VAE, you just have a normal prior. And this higher level layer will provide you with an expressive or more complex prior. And this way, if your if your prior is, is more complex, then your posterior will be more expressive and makes more sense. The problem here uh, with with uh, this partitioning is this. So no, ma no matter, so, it, so it, the, the a prior reason to have the higher level layer is sort of washed out because your, your posterior at the level of Z1 will be super simple. It will be the variational, variational posterior. So if you, if you started out of a uh, bit, with, with, a, with, a, with a simple form of the variation posterior, uh, the, the higher level layer will not bring you the, uh, the, 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 the thing that you that, that it was it was made for. Uh, 
Okay, so so far I was I was just using principle. I was just using these computational principles uh, and and the natural image statistics to to try to to predict uh, neural responses. Um, still, uh, many of you were you're asking about how will this predict any sort of of uh, neural circuitry properties and uh, and the more detailed responses or ultimately one can phrase that okay so is the natural image statistics sufficient to uh, to to define all the details of the of the neural circuitry and uh, the answer is uh, lies in 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 this insight that that uh, that that more gave us that that uh, when we have the computer principles and the neural me uh, mechanisms, uh, we try to somehow with the models uh, bridge, bridge the gap it, it, between the two. And, uh, and uh, uh, you might have different levels of models like computational level models, which are those that, that we discussed so far where only the computational principles matter. Then you might have um, um, an algorithmic level model where uh, you might want to, to try to understand how those computations can be performed, uh, like uh, referring to, to Manish's uh, talk, where he, he spoke about, about uh, 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 DDC or PPC or sampling. Those are, those are algorithms uh, to make those computations happen, to, make, to, 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 uh, to perform uh, the computations necessary for uh, for, for, for inference. And then uh, there is an implementational level that concerns how actually uh, from two set of, of neurons, uh, uh, the, the synapses, uh, synapses uh, dendrites, et cetera, uh, you, can, you are able to, uh, to, to implement uh, these algorithms. And, uh, and uh, so, the, uh, so a, a goal might be, or, or a, yeah, a proper goal would be to uh, to go through all these all these levels. Um, uh, I will I will first what I, I will try to do in the in the in the ring time. I will go for the algorithm level, uh, and at the very very end, I will just refer to uh, to some implementation level uh, modeling. So um, I so. So here I, I just want to highlight uh, this that that uh, according to Manish's argument, there is no reason not to uh, to represent um, proper uh, probability distributions uh, in the brain when one wants to to drive actions, uh, which is a, a theoretical uh, standpoint. It still it still might be a question whether it is true that uh, that the the, the neural uh, 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 machinery actually represents um, the, the, the uncertainties associated with, with our inferences. And um, uh, here, I, I, don't, I won't go uh, through the, the very details of this, of this study. This uh, come, came from, the, from Andreas Tolias's lab, where they, they showed that, that if you have a large number of, of, uh, of trials, you have a large number of, of, uh, of neurons recorded, uh, then, uh, uh, you can you might be able to uh, to infer uh, the sort of like uh, the distribution that that the the, the, the neurons represent. You you, might, you can build a model which represents uh, the the uncertainty associated with a, with a, with, with, a, uh, with a stimulus being presented, or one that uh, that uh, that ignores this this uncertainty based on neural recordings. You you can do this uh, do this model. And uh, and then uh, 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 if you have a large no enough number of neurons, then you can do it in a trial by trial basis, and uh, and then you will be able to uh, to uh, to predict um, uh, the behavior, the choices of, of the animal. And so so this paper is actually a, the, the 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 perfect demonstration of of Manish's claim is that if if I I'm using a, a uh, a model that ignores, so it uh, it it tries to infer uh, stimulus uh, values from the uh, from the um, from the neural responses such that 
it ignores the possibility of representing the uncertainty, then uh, we won't be able to uh, to to predict uh, the behavior of the, the animal as well. Uh, so it's sort of uh, just reinforcing uh, Manish's claim. But uh, so so how so so Manish uh, uh, showed one way to uh, to uh, to represent uh, uncertainties to represent the probability distribution. Uh, that was uh, the DDC. Um, and um, and here I will just very briefly try to uh, to present the idea behind uh, behind how uh, one can um, one can represent uh, this vision uh, with another method uh, uh, sampling and and uh, and then I will I will come up with a with a situation where I can contrast uh, the two. So so the idea behind behind sampling uh, is this that that uh, we we are representing um, some features uh, with our neural responses, and uh, and if uh, this uh, if we are doing uh, inference and this is a probabilistic inference, then uh, these these neurons need to to, to somehow represent a, a whole probability distribution. Um, and um, and uh, to to do approximate uh, inference or so to find this posterior distribution, one can uh, turn to different methods. Uh, not probabilistic would be just a maximum posterior inference, uh, inference where it just uh, finds the, the expectation of the of the posterior or uh, variational inference or or something. Uh, so something uh, the idea is this. Uh, so uh, a neuron would would uh, represent uh, the intensity of of a particular uh, contributing to to an image, for instance. How much, how intensely a particular edge is present in, in a stimulus, uh, then um, uh, you would have uh, a probability distribution over over possible uh, contributions, and uh, and the probability distribution can be can be represented by by a, a histogram instead of of the of the whole curve. I have a lot of trouble on you know, having a clear understanding of what that means either mathematically or biologically. So what do you mean exactly? So when one neuron fires, let's say I look at one neuron, I measure it's firing 10 spikes in some time window. And what does it mean that this is the strength of a, like mathematically, what does it mean biologically, what does it mean? The, uh, you are asking what does it mean that uh, the contribution is assumed to be represented by the intensity of the of the of the response, or what does it mean uh, to have a sample? Well, you measure the output of a neuron, right? Yes. And then you you want to have some mapping between that output and some something in the physical world. So what exactly? that mapping what are the two quantities so if you are certain uh, that that uh, that uh, the particular feature contributes to uh, to a given level uh, to um, uh, to an image so it is the um, what does that mean that means that image is a linear combination of so you you have you have a, you have a simple image uh, which contributes to, uh, this is from a single little Gabor field there, okay? And uh, in that case, if there is a neuron uh, that that has a, a receptive field exactly the, the, the that uh, that uh, Gabor field there, then uh, this neuron would fire heavily, and this can be sort of like an intuition uh, for how heavily. Uh, it is responding is is uh, just calculate the dot product between the image and the and the receptive field. Okay, but that's the Ford model that is the classical receptive. Yeah, yeah, model, yeah. Which yeah. Is not what some what you're saying, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, but something. but so this is a sort of a, a deterministic uh, case uh, in in the in the case of of a uh, of uh, probabilistic inference is also affected by by the prior. But still, if it's a point estimate, uh, then a, a given intensity of response will be there uh, uh, depending on uh, the for instance the contrast of the of the, of the Gabor filter right makes sense so the intensity of the response will deter be determined by, by the contrast of the Gabor filter to be related to it yeah and uh, and if 
if uh, if we assume that that uh, our observations are, are noisy uh, or there is some sort of any, any sort of ambiguity associated with 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 with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with the image that we that we see, then uh, instead of a sharp posterior or point estimate, we have a, a distribution of possible intensities that might underlie my observation. And and the, and the sampling uh, mean uh, when you are you are doing something is that that you visit the different possible interpretations of the image. Maybe it's uh, three spikes from strong the that feature, or maybe that's fifteen spikes from that interpretation. The frequency with which you visit the different possible interpretations will be proportional to the to the to the uh, probability distribution. Okay, so it's okay that. It means difficult to understand this. So imagine, so imagine I take a, a picture yeah. and I say I have 10 different features, my 10 gamma, and any image I consider is a linear combination of these features. Okay, which is definitely not the case for natural images, yeah. but let's suppose. Then you want to say, okay, neuron one is associated to basis function one, neuron two is associated to it. So if neuron one fires, three spikes, I will interpret this that my image contains a Gabor filter with intensity three. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? And yes. the one time this neuron will fire three spikes, one time two spikes, one time 17 spikes. So now I have a distribution, I have some empirical, some histogram of the intensity of that specific um, uh, Kind of patch. Okay. Yes. So I have two. So my two questions about this is that um, first of all, this contains many assumptions. That I mean, first of all, it, it's unclear images are linear combinations or anything. It's like, it's, it's part of the likelihood. Yes. Okay. Secondly, I mean, why would one neuron be specifically doing that? I mean, well, there's no reason that I should believe that this is the case, right? I mean, the, there's no indications that neurons are designed that way. Designed the way to represent probability distributions or designed uh, to represent features? Well, I mean, designed to represent features, yes, in the sense that they would be more, the activity would be more correlated to some images than others. So in that yeah. sense, okay. yes, but, um, but then beyond this, so already this kind of mapping for me is, I don't know where, how it's motivated and, and what are exactly the assumptions it's relying on. And but then the other thing is that this is a mapping that makes sense for me who's watching the neuron, right? So I'm looking at the neuron, say, oh, this neuron fires three spikes. So now I will draw this Gabor filter on my image, and then I look at this other neuron. So on. but for the brain, like biologically, what does it mean? It means that the brain has to have a dictionary in, in coming and measuring this neuron, saying, oh, then I have to draw. So there has this whole machinery has to be there in the brain to do that to interpret what this neuron is doing, right? Yeah, I think that that uh, part of the of the of the of of, of of your objection objection might come from this this abstraction of uh, of associating of, of trying to assess trial by trial variability, which which is a, a rather insane thing. So. Why would uh, a neuron sort of do trials? Uh, and let me let me go like two uh, two clicks uh, forward, and then um, uh, there I hope I hope to give you an, an intuition which uh, which is much better than the this uh, the super abstract interpretation that that uh, I spike uh, uh, intensity in one trial and spike intensity in the second trial and so on uh, would would map me the the probability distribution he, Not understand. i just want to understand really kind of precisely what are the statements yeah uh, let me click two or three and and we, we get back to here so in order to to obtain a a um a histogram like this i just need a mechanism uh that can uh, that that is such that uh, it it visits different parts of this intensity space uh, properly. This is called 
uh, a sampling mechanism or, or uh, yeah, pretty much a sampling dynamics. So if we have this, uh, this is actually something that, that, that one, can, one can easily implement. Then how would we relate this to, uh, to neural responses? So imagine that, uh, that we, uh, we measured the, uh, the membrane potential of, of two neurons uh, to a specific uh, image. And, uh, and this would be uh, the, the mean uh, membrane potential response to, uh, to that image. But what we see is that, uh, that uh, the membrane potential uh, changes over time. So now, if we, instead of, of this one dimensional, of these one dimensional marginalized marginal, marginals, we point not the joint distribution of the membrane potential. Uh, this is uh, what we have. Uh, this would be as we as the time goes forward, uh, uh, the memory potentials visit different parts of the of the joint activity space uh, uh, in time. So this way, in a in a matter of of three hundred milliseconds, uh, what we see there is that. There is some sort of a variability associated with the with the responses. Uh, they might be correlated. Uh, these responses, uh, and uh, and uh, ultimately, uh, this this bowl of spaghetti uh, uh, will correspond to uh, to uh, to um, um, sort of a, a set of uh, continuous samples uh, from this distribution. And and then what you expect is that if I don't know the the, the orientation of the of of, uh, of the stimulus changes. Uh, then uh, the the means of these guys uh, will change. Uh, and the the main question is this uh, that one might ask. Okay, so so how can we can we can we have any sort of insight whether this neat idea makes any sense or not? And uh, and uh, and the, the the main insight here is that that if uh, this these samples, these samples correspond to, uh, to, to, to variability, to, to, to our uncertainty in, uh, in, in our inferences. That means that if we change the uncertainty uh, in the stimulus by some manipulation of the stimulus, then we should see some systematic changes in the, in the variability. And that, that's the key point here, that there should be, be, be the, 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 the usual approach is that, that uh, we, seek systematic changes in the, in the mean responses. And if, the, according to, to, to the sampling view, uh, if, uh, if it is true, then, then, uh, then um, uh, some uncertainty is, is changing, we should see as systematic changes uh, in the variance of the responses or the correlations in the, of the responses as uh, uh, systematic changes there were in the mean responses. Yes? I'm still very, very quickly. So if the new, if imagine neurons were completely noiseless, yes, and every time I show stimulus, I get some neural output. And for if, if the stimulus two still are different, the two neural output would be different. Then I would know exactly what the brain would know exactly what it's seeing, right? We yeah. wouldn't need probability. We wouldn't need any of this. Yeah, yeah. So right? if so if we have a, a, so a generative model which is which is deterministic, then uh, you expect that that. Uh, that if feature intensities are are, are absolutely by, by neurons, then, then uh, we don't have think. to think about features. I'm saying if there's a one-to-one -one mapping between anything I can see and neural yeah. activity, then the yeah. brain is perfect, that it discriminates everything and so on. So now we're saying it's not the case, but then you're saying that randomness that I see is to kind of give an empirical approximation to a probability. Yeah. That probability is there only because there is randomness. So I, I don't understand how the... No, no. So if you know, that would be a, really a tautology. But uh, but no, so the idea is this. Uh, uh, Manish told us that we should better represent uh, uncertainties or whole probability distributions. Due to neurons or, or, in, due or to inferences. So, if our neurons represent uh, features, then uh, we should represent uh, uncertainties or the uncertainty associated with, uh, with, the, with the presence of features. For me, again, it's not a question. I really want to understand what yeah. are the statements, and I don't manage for now at least to understand. So, 
Suppose that an image has only one feature. Yes. So I show the brain an image with only one Gabor um, filter in it. So there's one neuron in the brain that's kind of monitoring those Gabor according to this view, right? This, the intensity of my Gabor function is known in the physical world. Yes. Can be objectively measured. If the neuron was not noisy, it would just respond exactly that intensity. Yeah. Okay. So the only thing that is probabilistic is the fact that the neuron is no. I, I mean, so, so what? What's so, uh, so so imagine uh, from a generative point of view uh, this scenario. We have a neuron uh, which is a receptive field uh, forty five degrees, and I have another one. Uh, that has a receptive field uh, that has a you know, at, 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 uh, 42 degrees. So when I, I look at the at the image, I cannot be certain. I cannot be certain uh, whether it's a, a 42 or a 45 uh, degree uh, stimulus or is, whether it's a, a 43. So there is some sort of some uncertainty, uncertainty which. Which uh, feature underlies? Uh, I, don't think, I don't think this is correct because if you have, imagine that I have ten possible orientation, and then I have a neuron that is responding without noise. So I know that if it's responding the maximum orientation, the maximum firing it can, it will be the orientation that corresponds to its to its preferred direction, and then a little bit less will be the other one, and so on. So if the neuron is not noisy, there is no ambiguity. But rather, you're setting up a situation where you wouldn't need to represent the uncertainty. In reality, you always will. But there is, what I'm saying is that there is no uncertainty in the physical object, right? I mean, do you measure it perfectly? Okay, so then you're saying there's noise in the measurement, so noise in the brain. Well, I, but think, I think what is being suggested here is that your brain doesn't want to ever be certain because it should hedge its bets, right? So why would we want to create a risk? But so why would it have you all your weight on the one angle, 45 and 60? I mean, if you, you might forget about the brain, if you have a sensor that is measuring something, you want your sensor to be to have as little noise as possible. But it can't no. remove it entirely. Okay, so then any uncertainty has to do with internal noise. Or internally generated variability, or I don't know what that's what we call noise. Fluctuations are. That's what we call noise. So again, I, I, so no, again, so I, I, I think that, that at the level of, of, of edge filters, it's not that evident what we are seeing for apart from, from noisy sensors. But uh, in fact, if we look a bit further uh, down the, uh, the processing hierarchy, then it's much easier to uh, to understand the sort of, of, of problems that, that we are faced with. So when uh, when we are, are trying to, to infer um, 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 the, you know, uh, the the pose of an object or uh, the direction of a particular object, uh, um, uh, then then when we want, want to make this inference. It is certainly true. uncertainty. Not if, not if I have enough neurons and not if the noise is small enough. Well, not in the situation that was modeled earlier where there was. So, so, um, you, so if you imagine if I, you, have any, I have an image, right? The world, and I have my photoreceptors. Okay, they define some resolution just by their size and so on. But suppose the photoreceptors were not noisy, I would have just a photocopy in my eye of, of that image. There would be no ambiguity. There could be ambiguity if, for example, I have to infer a three-dimensional object from a two-dimensional, but it's not any more ambiguity yeah, so, about so the, the image. The, the, the problem is that, that our word, uh, even at, if we consider V1, mm -hmm. the word is not consisting of, of, the, of the receptive field that these guys uh, um, are are characterized with, so uh, we have some sort of a, a full. Uh, we have a, a complete representation, even of the of, of the of the environmental stimuli, 
uh, but still none of the of the of the so the the, the stimuli that we observe are not exactly uh, just uh, the superpositions linear sort of linear superpositions of of the of the of the of the filters that uh, that uh, these uh, neurons are characterized with. Okay. Uh, so uh, when you you train a generative model uh, on on natural images, then you might uh, want to to, uh, to to learn the level of observation noise. It turns out that that the, the level of observation noise cannot be uh, shrank arbitrarily uh, because there will be always there, is there, there will be always always uh, some level of of some but some variance that you cannot account for. But there's and this scattering in the eye, okay, of light that will create noise. But then you, then it sounds like you're saying that this noise, which may come from scattering in the eye, somehow indicates something which doesn't seem to be obvious. Norm, normally, uh, the so so you you seem to be. Um, rejecting the idea that that the noise is. Uh, this noise is, is a good enough reason to, to introduce a probabilistic representation. No, but I, 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 but let me, so, uh, normally it's the noise that is easiest to use when one wants to, to introduce the, the notion of uncertainty, but certainly uh, the ambiguity that we, we are faced with when interpreting images are much, much, much more interesting than, than the noise itself. So noise, noise is a, is a is a paradigmatic example, but certainly not the 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 the, the sort of uh, of uh, uncertainty. Um, so not not the, the the most interesting source of uncertainty. Un uncertainty that we want to. Given the time, yes, we should one, one, one more comment, and then I will stop, and we can talk after. But I agree. But so imagine I want to infer like three dimensional. Um, uh, 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 the orientation of a head, let's say, three dimensions from a two-dimensional image, which is the kind of ambiguity I think we're talking about. But then shouldn't my neurons have features that are not Gabor patches, but features that are in three dimensions? Yeah, so so uh, the, the more interesting forms of, of, uh, of inferences are beyond uh, beyond linear filters. And there, uh, the forms of ambiguities are, are much more interesting as well. So uh, the, I, I believe that that at the level of, of V1, you might ask, so if I if I present an image on which there is a single Gabor, then uh, why is my 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 neuron still uh, um, uh, is, is still noisy? Uh, so this this is a fair question. So my uh, for this, uh, an, um, an easy answer is that that this is not a natural image. So when uh, the, the 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 brain makes inferences about what's going on here, uh, then all the all the top down influences will come in, and uh, and and this way sort of uh, we are sampling the possibly high level high level interpretations, and uh, and those uh, those high level interpretations will. Will be injected as as noise. But, so it's... So if, if it was a if it was the case that we are in a very simple world, where uh, it's a linear combination of 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 of, of Gabor's, uh, then in, and there is no noise at all, uh, then we should be able to learn a generative model uh, which makes a, a deterministic mapping because there is because this is this is our world. But if if the if the if the if the statistical structure of the image is, is more complex than that, then certainly there there will be some variance that uh, will not be able I will not be able to to account for uh, with uh, with the uh, with, uh, with the generative model itself. So uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but even though we're we're 12 minutes over time already, we're going to wrap up. Yes. Um, okay, I, I will. So, um, yeah. So, so if if we just just take this uh, lesson that uh, that uh, that we we expect 
changes in, in not only in the mean responses, but also uh, in the variance of the response, systematic variations in the, in the, in the, in the variance of, of responses, then, then we can turn back to, uh, to our original uh, Gaussian scale mixtures model uh, where uh, uh, we can calculate uh, the posterior uh, to uh, sampling and then uh, check whether uh, how, how different sort of manipulations that are usually done in experiments uh, can, be, can be predicted. So, uh, oh yeah, so, so uh, this is just a, a very simple intuition about how, for instance, uh, things like contrast will, will affect uh, the responses. And uh, so here I just want to, to, uh, to deliver this intuition that, that if there is a high contrast image, uh, sorry. Uh, so if there is a high contrast image, uh, then uh, the posteriors uh, will be very, very different for different images. So the green, blue, and red are the posteriors for different images for uh, two simple cells. Uh, and uh, and uh, so this, this uh, gray one is the, is the prior. And uh, if we decrease the contrast, but, uh, then what will happen will be that that uh, we will actually rely more on our prior. So we will get slightly closer to, uh, with, with our posterior to, to our prior. Uh, the variances in the means will decrease. So how much the means deviate from, from, the, from the prior. Uh, but the, the variance of, of the individual little clouds will increase. So here we were more, uh, more certain what's going on in the environment. Here we are less certain, and if we decrease the contrast very much, then our, our uh, posteriors will be very close to the prior. So the means will not vary too much, but the, the, the contrast will be high. So here we see a decoupling of, of, of the mean and the, and the variance of the, of the response. The mean will decrease while the variance uh, will, uh, will increase. So this is a rather strong uh, intuition. Um, and this is something that that one can one can check. And the, the way one does it that uh, we are we are doing these manipulations, uh, like how stimulus onset uh, affects uh, mean activity, how contrast orientation and uh, and uh, uh, contextual affect uh, how these uh, these affect uh, the, the responses. So the mean uh, activity uh, uh, stimulus onset obviously will increase. Uh, with decreasing contrast, it will decrease. The uh, orientation uh, uh, related changes can be uh, can be both directions. For some neurons, it will be higher to uh, others uh, lower, etc. And the variance uh, it has a different prediction. Uh, so the, uh, with stimulus onset, the, the memory potential variance will decrease. Uh, also, the final factor, which is uh, measured for 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 measuring the the variability of of spiking responses. Uh, with contrast decrease, again, the variance will uh, uh, increase. With orientation, the variance uh, will, will stay the same and the final factors, et cetera. So what we see here is that there is a very strong um, uh, sort of pattern uh, in, in, in predictions that, that uh, we can check. And, um, and the, uh, if one, one goes after, after these, these experiments where, where these, um, these quantities are, are, are manipulated, uh, one can consistently predict these changes um, with with uh, with a, a sampling scheme, um, and um, yeah. So I I will um, I will then wrap up here, and uh, I won't uh, go in the direction of uh, of trying to to directly contrast uh, uh, PPC and, and DDC. Um, I will just uh, go with with this. Um, so, so I, I went through uh, these functional models where usually the, it was the, the natural uh, environment and, and uh, some computer visual tools uh, that were used to, uh, to predict uh, neural uh, responses. And I, I was arguing along with, 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 uh, with many others uh, during the school that uh, it, it makes sense to, uh, to use an unsupervised approach. Uh, during this second talk, we, we actually um, 
touched upon possible uh, other learning schemes, uh, which are not that um, um, determined about about the, the complete uh, absence of of uh, of signals that would that can be used uh, to uh, to to shape the, the representation, such as rewards. But certainly, those those also shape uh, shape our representations. But our, what I'm arguing for is that that if we are we are we are learning representations that are uh, task determined, uh, then then we will end up uh, with with a uh, with a machinery uh, that is optimized for a particular task and and uh, and will not be that good for for the wealth of tasks that that we can actually very easily adapt when when we are told to. So when uh, the, by task, I, I also mean that if we observe a particular uh, situation in our environment, we can in the, we can interrogate ourselves or others uh, with tons of questions. What will happen next? Each question can be uh, considered as a as a task for a, a discriminatory model. Uh, which way a uh, uh, Jenga tower will uh, uh, will lean? Uh, uh, how far uh, the pieces will uh, will fly, etc. If you use a, a supervised setting for each of these questions, uh, you can train a separate model. But if you want to have uh, um, a representation which is such that when someone comes up with a new question, you will be able to, to answer that question. And uh, this requires some sort of a representation uh, which is not that task specific as a, a supervised setting would, uh, would dictate. Um, and, um, and so originally, I, I was I was uh, showing tons of of questions uh, uh, that are addressed at the at the computational level. Now I was I was also uh, uh, showing something at the algorithmic level, and uh, and uh, and if we just keep with this this problem set, there are beautiful papers on, on on the implementation level as well. How a recurrent neural network can actually implement uh, this, uh, for instance, this sampling. I mean, I'm not not that advocating sampling as the ultimate uh, solution for uh, for representing probabilistic uh, uh, computations. What I'm saying is that that uh, the best thing is that from the computational level down to the implementation level, you have some sort of uh, so, so, some sort of a, a model uh, that that addresses it. Now, it's a I think it's a it's a super interesting question whether a particular problem a particular observation should it be uh, addressed at the at the computational algorithm or the implementational level so for instance when i spoke about uh, uh the, the the illusory contours uh there i used a, a computational level argument that that uh, if we are doing um hierarchical inference then uh, uh it will be such that that our inferences will be affected by high level interpretations of the of the stimulus uh, but in fact there are other interpretations like like predictive coding also uh involves uh this sort of top down influences but when i say predictive coding it is actually an algorithmic level interpretation of of what's going on so so for me, it seems, but it's not uh, not the ultimate uh, solution for this or answer to this question. So if you can uh, you you can address a, a, a particular observation at the at the higher level, like at the computational level, uh, it it can be a more promising one than than uh, if you address the same thing at the algorithm level. But it's a sort of an aesthetic argument. Um, some there are some 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 phenomena that, that are addressed in uh, the level of implementation according to, to, to my understanding as well. Uh, but if uh, you find uh, a high level uh, interpretation uh, or, uh, or formulation of, the pro of this, of this, of this uh, observation, then, then uh, I would vote for, for, for that one. Um, and uh, what I did not uh, address uh, but what I skipped uh, in this talk uh, was this uh, this issue when when we we do not really know what the, the generative model is. For instance, in in planning, uh, you don't necessarily are able to to specify well what sort of of generative model uh, might underlie uh, planning. 
and still uh, one might have tools uh, to to address these questions, then you might actually just just uh, go for the whole problem at the algorithmic level. So so uh, you assume that okay, some sort of um, uh, uh, a planning is going on uh, in the brain, and particularly, for instance, in the hippocampus. And then, uh, for the for the uh, for for this planning, uh, you will construct uh, different um, algorithmic level solutions. Although you don't know the generative model, so the computation not principles are unclear. Uh, but the, at the algorithmic level, uh, you can construct uh, different models, and then then you can construct those or con contrast uh, those algorithmic level interpretations. Um, so I will stop here. Um, uh, thank you for all the many questions uh, that I had. Um, I hope I, I, I could uh, inspire those questions, all the questions that you're learning and, uh, and you, will, you were able to ask those. If you have more, then just feel free to, to come and ask. Thank you. All right, so th thank you again. I want to, uh, we're going to go into the wrap up session, but before that, can we again thank our last <laughs> remaining um, <laughs> lectures in Babel? Uh, I don't know, is the, uh, uh, do we have any lecturers in Beijing still? Yes, we have Temi here and the, all yeah, the is organizers. Okay, so we want to thank really profusely our three. Uh, lecturers who stayed until the end, uh, me, um, Cameron and Kirko. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gergo, for staying to the last minute. I think we're going to uh, go to the wrap up session. Chuan, you want to moderate? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to moder moderate. So, what we are going to do.